Hey everybody, Wayne here. In today's overview and review, we are going to be taking a look at the Grass Crown. The Grass Crown is a tactical scope ancients game using the Shields and Swords ancient system. It's played on a square grid map that uses train tile to customize the map for different scenarios. The game was designed by Amiville Holland and is published by Holland Spiel. Now, for those who don't know, a Grass Crown was the Roman Republic's highest military honor and was given to an individual whose actions saved an entire legion or army. The Grass Crown, fittingly enough, focuses on 10 battles of the Roman Republic. It starts with the Battle of Heraclea in 280 BC and ends with the Battle of Munda in 45 BC. Now, over the course of the 10 battles, you're going to see the evolution of the Roman army. From its beginnings as a citizen, soldier, farmer army fighting as maniples, the three lines that were grouped together um, generally by experience and equipment, until it became the professional legionaries after the Marian reforms. In this video, we just did our introduction. I'm going to do a quick overview. Now, I do have a tutorial playthrough with a very in-depth um, overview and, you know, tutorial. So that is going to have, you know, everything in depth. I'm just going to cover that stuff quick here in my overview. I will then do my pros and cons, cons first, and wrap up with my final thoughts. So let's go ahead and dive in. All right, let's start with the overview. So taking a look at the map and the terrain tiles. So I mentioned before, it is a square grid, not a hex grid. It, that really, you know, at first when you see it, you're like, oh, that's interesting. It really doesn't play a huge effect on the way the game works it, in the sense it doesn't complicate things, right? It's very simple. Um, movement for foot units is going to be um, orthogonal. So it's going to be, you know, up and down, left and right. Horse units, cavalry, they're going to be able to actually go through the corners. Other than that, pretty simple, pretty standard. Um, nothing too... Uh, complicated there. Now, unlike With It or On It, which was the first game in the Shields and Swords Ancient series, this one has introduced the terrain tiles. So you see the three terrain tiles that are in grass ground here. You know, you have um, hills, broken ground, and water, rivers. So depending on the scenario, which right now, the besides the command tokens and the terrain here, which I just have just to show you guys, um, you can see I have units set up this is a separate battle, um, actually the Battle of Versailles in 101 BC. So you have you know, your units set up, and depending on the map, you may have different terrain that are set up. They may be on flanks. That's it was often the case with the rivers. You'll see you know, one side would kind of anchor their flank with a river, um, but you may see where one side, hey, they, they are on high ground, or you know, there's broken terrain involved, etc. This game introduces that, um, unlike with it or on it, which should not have any terrain tiles. Now... We'll take a look at the units and then the commands. So the units themselves, very simple. You have ex two examples here. We have cavalry and then we have foot unit. You can see individual artwork on the counter. Foot unit here, he is a heavy infantry. You can see the H in the top left. The top right is his combat class, a B. It starts, um, it goes up, excuse me, it starts at the top with a star, which is a hero, used to be called a leader and with it or on it. Um, hero combat class with a star, then A, B, C, D. Um, in the bottom left there, you can see a morale rating. So some of the units, generally these um, heavy infantry, they're you know more veterans. They have an actual morale rating, meaning they could possibly survive a rout, whereas something like a light infantry, more of a barbarian here, and yes, there are elephants in the back of the cavalry, um, do not have that morale rating. In addition, like I said, you have horses, you have cavalry, and you also have elephants. Um, with the cavalry here, you can see they have a diamond. And by the way, the top right, you're seeing a victory point number. And I'll explain the stripes in a second. Um, cavalry will go ahead and have a diamond. That's going to determine basically how many dice you roll. And then also, if fighting other cavalry, whether they get to get an additional modifier on their dice rolls. Um, for the infantry here, when they take hits, you're going to flip them over. And you're going to see what's on the back. Both of these with double stripes, that means those are brittle units. Those are automatically eliminated. If a unit had a single stripe like this one, oh, <laughs> like this one, that's a hero unit. Oh my gosh, I was trying to find one with a single stripe just to show you guys quick. <laughs> okay, so that one right there, as you can see, has a single stripe. That means he is now exhausted. He's no longer a fresh unit. He's exhausted, but he's not eliminated yet. He has a chance to rally. 
Speaking of heroes that we mentioned earlier, that star, so at the top, when you see him, he looks like a regular unit. When they're all lined up, just looks like a regular unit. But when he takes a hit, he goes ahead and flips over, and he reveals that star. Now he does become a target for the enemy, because if you eliminate him, it reduces your rally limit down. Starts at four. If rally limit ever gets to zero, you lose automatically. But he's got that star, that hero combat class, so he inflicts a lot of... He's a really good chance, let's just say, to inflict a hit on the enemy. So those are the units themselves. Again, for a more in-depth, check out my tutorial um, tutorial uh, playthrough. Also, let's look at the commands here. So what happens is you can see your forces here divided up into wings. And they're grouped by color. Pretty simple, right? So you have, you know, say a red wing. And <laughs> pretend he had his guys back there. Red wing, orange wing, you know, you have white wing cavalry, gold cavalry, etc., etc. Whichever side has the turn, they're going to be issuing commands. Now, they have some command markers. The two key ones here are these. Now, a unique feature of this game, you cannot issue any command you want. I should say you can issue a command you want. You can't necessarily issue any combination you want. What I mean by that is the command markers are double-sided, and that is intentional, meaning a game you might say, okay, I want to conduct a rally. So you throw out a rally command. And I'm going to do a move. So my guys are going to move. So they're going to rally and move. Or you may say, all right, they're going to go ahead and skirmish. And they're going to move. Now, what you couldn't do, you couldn't say, well, I want them to move. And then attack. This is combat. You know, the gladius. In the same turn. Say they're adjacent. I want them to move. And then you can't do that. You have to pick one of the commands. So each turn, you're picking your commands. You're actually limited. So you may have a case where instead of doing the two commands you're normally allowed... You may only really have one command that makes sense. Maybe you don't need a rally. Maybe you can't do a skirmish. The skirmish zone is gone. In which case, you would go ahead and just maybe conduct a combat. Or maybe you just move your guys. And that's all you could do. So sometimes your commands are going to be limited by the situation you know, in the battle on the board. These commands can be modified. So there is the Aquila marker. You know, the eagle standard, right? So with the Romans, very, very important. You can go ahead. You can assign that to a command. And it would actually basically increase the effectiveness of that command so maybe a case where you do aquila move so now they get to do two moves in a row now the second move will be reduced in effectiveness you can't move the same amount the second time because your men are a little winded right so it'll be a full movement of four squares do an aquila the second one would a bonus move they call it would only be two squares you know something like a skirmish which skirmish is this game's version of range combat now it's abstracted Really say here, you're seeing heavy infantry, and that's it. You see some cavalry, some light infantry. Where are the skirmishers, right? Where are the auxila? Where are the, you know, slingers and archers? They're not featured in this game. They're abstracted. So when you're throwing down the old skirmish, you're saying, all right, you know, my red wing is going to be skirmishing here. There's, you know, they're going and attack, doing range attacks. You are abstractly representing the damage inflicted not only by maybe the heavy infantry the legionaries with their pila but by those lighter infantry slingers archers etc um, i mentioned using the aquila to go ahead and kind of modify a command so instead of doing you know two different commands you can maybe you can go ahead your two one of your commands counts as the aquila throw it down with your rally now you have a better chance to rally your units you also have two other markers there's an initiative marker which allows you to basically take a second turn in a row it then passes your opponent and there is the Fortuna marker. Romans were huge believers in luck. One side will start off with it with two dice rolls. They can change. Flip it over for the first one. You get to re-roll a die. Flip it over for the last one. If you do it a second time, it then passes your opponent, just like the initiative marker. Scenarios will start set up like this. You'll have your units, you know, facing each other. You're going to be moving, engaging in combat. Um, you know, it's fairly standard, fairly simple. When you have units that are adjacent... They're going to have supporting units where adjacent infantry, the attack, they're going to go ahead and pick a defender. When the defender takes a hit, generally they can assign it to any adjacent unit to them as well, unless the unit is exhausted. Remember, it has that white stripe on the back. Otherwise, you're going to be inflicting hits back and forth until too many units become exhausted. They're going to be eliminated. You're going to start seeing um, entire units route off the map. Victory points build up. One side is going to have a certain amount of victory points, usually something like 30, 40 just depends on the scenario. Victory points they need to get to. They usually need to also have like five more than the opponent unless they get to another threshold, in which case as soon as they reach it, they win. Or, like I said, if the enough heroes are eliminated, the rally limit drops and they lose automatically. One last thing with the commands. 
You can go ahead and do a command where if you combine Aquila with a command, you can do it to all your wings. So normally it would be, hey, you know, Aquila move to the red wing and only the red wing is going to move. Well, you could say Aquila red wing, but I'm, or excuse me, Aquila move, but I'm assigning it to everybody. That also would cause your rally limits to, know, to lower. It's like a, you know, big command to the entire army. Everyone move at once or everyone attack at once, etc. Like I said, you continue through until one side uh, gets enough victory points to win the scenario. I think that's it for the overview. There's a lot more to the game. Check out the tutorial playthrough to see. Otherwise, let's move on. All right. Let's look at my pros and cons. As usual, start with the cons first. So things I didn't like, things that could have been done better, or just in my opinion, could have been done differently. First off, occasionally the rule book, it won't explicitly state what you can or cannot be done or what you can or cannot do. And sometimes that can lead to confusion on whether something is allowed. And I know that, you know, there's kind of questions before of, hey, can everything, you can't have everything in the rule book, right? You can't have everything that says you can or can't do in the rule book. There's some things you kind of infer based on the rules overall. Um, an example though, where it caught me up was movement through friendly units. Most games mention whether that's allowed, right? Like it's kind of a common thing under movement, you know, it'll say one line, right? One sentence, friendly unit cannot move through a friendly unit, whatever. Um, it doesn't say that. And it doesn't say that in the rules. Now, thankfully the designer, uh, she's super active on board game geek. So she answers questions quickly. And that is one that I asked and she answered, I want to say probably within like the hour. So if you have something that comes up, you can ask it on BGG. It will get answered or over on Consim World. But there are occasionally a couple things when you're reading through the rule book where you might go, hmm, am I allowed to do that? And it, it's just not necessarily spelled out. Um, secondly, with the counters, and quick aside, the game is printed by Blue Panther. And they do games for a few other uh, smaller publishers, such as White Dog Games. I do a lot of White Dog Games on my channel because they have a lot of good solitaire games or, sol or solo-capable games that I cover. Um, but anyway, so Blue Panther prints it, right? And it's not, it's not Hounsville directly. It's Blue Panther who does it. But, you know, these counters, although I love the size and thickness, right? I mean, it's, you know, they're good size, nice thick. They're almost like a wood, like a layered wood. Well, that kind of comes into the problem is it's layered. So with this game in particular, I had an issue where I think about 10 of them had layer separating. And in fact, I think on my recon, my unboxing, when I was punching them out, one of them separated, like I showed you guys. I was like, oh, you gotta be careful. I think I ended up having 10. So out of the counter sheet and a half, I think, comes in the game, I had 10 of them. So I just had to put some super glue down in there, you know, seal them off, wipe off the XX super glue, you know, let them dry overnight before I could play the game. Just not the end of the world. Something I took care of. Now everything looks great. Can't even tell. But just something to be aware of um, when punching, first of all, with the components and when you're punching the game, just to be extra careful. All right, that's it for my cons. Let's go to my pros. So first off, I really like the artwork for the different unit types. Um, and with it or on it, the first game, the Shields and Swords Ancient series, the artwork was just black silhouettes. And there's a certain charm to that, especially kind of at first glance. We need to see the cover, we need to see the units. It's like, oh, I kind of like that look. But I found that after hours of playing a game because it's the type of game you know you play different battles and you replay them and you try to you know each side to get a victory after hours of playing and staring at those black counters it lost its charm no problem here you know you have you can tell the difference straight away when you're looking you can see the you know heavy infantry and they look like legionaries right with their shield and their armor versus you know light infantry here um cavalry old horse head on there the the elephant, you know, you got you to gotta love it. Like, I really enjoy it. Um, You know, it's not that each one is completely separate. But what I like are two things. One, you have the color for the wings, which was in with it on as well, right? The very clear colors for the wings. So you always know who is in a wing. And that's something a game like sometimes Simple Great Battles of History or Great Battles of History. Excuse me, I play simple version. But with Great Battles of History, you'll lose track of, wait, which line was, a you know, together? I, I don't know. Um, in this game, you never have that issue because they're color coded for the wings, but you see the wing colors. And then when you look down in the unit, when you're down there and you're doing, you know, combat back and forth, you're seeing, Hey, these are my legionaries. Hey, those are light infantry. You know, those look like barbarians, right? Like, Hey, these look like phalanxes, phal you know, part of a phalanx. Lady. Like, I love that. I love the artwork on that. So it's really appreciated. Um, another thing, the terrain tiles, great addition to the game. 
It allows for battles that were influenced by terrain to one degree or another. You know, a lot of ancient battles were fairly fought on like fairly plain, well, literally plains, right? Level, ground, etc. But that wasn't always the case. There were some very important battles with some very important things that happened that occurred um, with terrain, right? Terrain was involved. So I love the fact that that is an aspect here. I look forward to it. It works well with the, the scenarios in this game. And I know it's going to really pay off in the future because I assume, considering the size of the box, there's probably going to be some expansions that they'll be able to just, you'll be able to include in this box because they sent it's an extra thick box. Um, so I'd love having all the terrain tiles for sure. Uh, finally, um, the game, it just simply does a fantastic job showing the evolution of the Roman army over a period of nearly 250 years. The system rules, you know, the way they are, they provide a really solid base and with it or on it was a good game, but this game takes you through a journey. I mean, you are covering all kinds of differences, um, in, from the very beginning, right? When you're talking about the uh, triple X ACs, right? The the three units, the maniples, the three lines, excuse me, of Romans to then evolving into the Marian, more of traditional like legions that we think of the legionaries, you know, them in more of a, uh, not say box formation, but just kind of well, how they're popular catches our imagination, right? This game has those aspects that all kind of fit together. So you're going from one, really one era of, Roman combat, and that's the, one of the things I love about the Roman Empire and Roman, you know, Roman Republic, Roman Empire, was the fact that they adapted, and that's why they lasted so long, right? They always were adapting. Hey, they were like that. Well, that's a good tactic. Let's take it, or that's we need to defeat that one. Let's adjust our army, and that's what they did, and that's what you're able to see in this game. So, um, I could go more on that there, but let's go ahead. Actually, let's wrap up the pros, um, and let's go into the final thoughts. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So, final thoughts. With it or on it, it was a good game, and I enjoyed it. However, in my opinion, the Grass Crown blows it out of the water. Every part of the Grass Crown is a superior game and experience, in my opinion. From the graphical design, you know, all those counters and the artwork, pulling you in, immersing you in that ancient's feel, to the game mechanics that do an excellent job simulating the way these battles were fought without getting bogged down in minutia, tedious counter, marker manipulation. I mean, you can easily play an entire battle in an hour or two, depending on which scenario you choose. You know, I talked about having, um, and you will you saw it in my tutorial playthrough, and I know it's a lot of stuff to go over, but it's just, you know, it's hard to fit everything in a review, right? I'm trying to give you guys a really condensed version of why is this game, why do I like it, why is it good, and, and if, in my opinion, is it good? But then also, is my opinion going to match yours? So, you know, talking about the, you know, giving that ancients feel and simulating these battles. You know, when you have rules that are not overly complicated, that are easy to get into, but that quickly explain, hey, you can swap these Roman units. You have a line, you know, the lines that then next line becomes activated. Or when you get into the, after the Marian reforms where you have units that they would be, able, they can swap to um, be, have a better chance to rally and that fits in with the history right when you really know the history of the roman army and at those points in times you're seeing that and you're seeing those things and they're represented in this game as you play all in a, a very comfortably sized rule book and set of rules so uh, the game now it's effectively it's a, it's a two-player right it's an i go you go system however it solitaires really well the only hidden information that it has basically is the presence of the hero units, the star, right? The leaders and whether unit is brittle or not, but that's actually also hidden from that side's player. So during setup, you randomly are drawing from a cup. You're putting the appropriate color and then maybe there may be some changes. You take out some brittle units or, or, you know, there's always only a certain amount of heroes. Um, but you put those in a cup, you draw, you place them, but you're never exactly sure where the weak spots are in your line until they break which that I think that follows history, right? Yes, you may you may have a general idea of, okay, this wing is strong, this army is strong, etc. Those are experienced men. But if a leader gets taken out or maybe there's a weak link you don't even know about, that wing, that part of the army, you know, suddenly your right flank starts collapsing, that's represented in this game because you're not, nothing's guaranteed, especially in warfare, right? Now, I have to say this. I think this is the first game that in its, in its way that I've played that can compete with great battles of history. 
Now, let's be clear. No, you aren't getting the, you know, the incredible amount of content that exists for Great Battles of History. How could you, right? <laughs> GBOH, they, they released, what, over a dozen box games? I mean, it's just, there's no competition in the amount of content, right? But I look at it like this. If Great Battles of History is the heavyweight king of Tackle Ancients games, I think Grass Crown is the lightweight counterpart. You know, it, if you want to go ahead and crown Great Battles of History, hey, they are, they're the, the kings of the heavyweight, you know, the, the longer rule set, longer games, more counters, more counter manipulation. And I love it too. I do love Great Battles of History, at least with the simple rules. Grass Crown seems like that. It has that feel. It has that nuance. It, it just brings out the passion for this type of warfare and this, this part of history in my mind. And of course, it's always my mind. It's my opinion, right? My review. Um, Grass Crown just does a great job. It's the lightweight version. I would pair them together and say, you want a quick playing lighter game that's going to just bring that flavor? Get the Grass Crown. You want heavier, more nuance, more detail? Any of the Great Battles of History, you know, whatever era suits you. So overall, highly recommended if you love Tactical Ancients games. Kudos to Amabel for an amazing design. You know, again, starting with the series, you know, that the um, Shields and Swords Ancients that she designed with with it or on it. What a, what a evolution of a design. Great job. I, I love it. Simply love it. I'm keeping it and be playing it a ton. And I am excited to see what Hollenspiel is going to do with the series from here. So, you know, more expansions for this. We got a, we got a big old box. It's an extra thick box. Um, I imagine there will be expansions, you know, future ones. I would love to start seeing some, uh, how about the uh, the Roman Empire era, right? See some Imperial armies getting into some combat. So maybe fighting with the, uh, you know, fighting with the Parthians or something like that. So anyway, fantastic overall. Hope you guys enjoyed my review, overview and review here. Again, I got other videos on the game. Love this game. Maybe there'll be more coming. I don't know. Big fan of it, though, as you can tell from my uh, gushing final thoughts there. But let me know what you think. Have you played it? Are you interested in it? You're going to pick it up now? Let me know. Let everyone else know and comment below. You know, share your opinion, share your thoughts on it. Share what you love for Ancients games, especially games that are still being released now that you can, you can pick up. So until next time, guys. Later.